Good afternoon, folks. Thank you so much for joining us, whether live or via recording. Hey. And today we're down to the nucleus of just the really old guy and the really young lady with very, very different experience, orientations, perspectives that we're going to bounce off each other and you folks. And if that raises questions in your mind, send them in. We'll be happy to address them respectfully, as understandingly as we can. We welcome those. So, Redin Kiahi Olalo has a wonderful background and probably understands as much about the role and value of the Hawaiian culture here as anyone I know and how it has been and is being treated in different sectors. Hey, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit today because we're in the holidays and we have grown up in a history that has not just neglected and ignored that, but misrepresented it painfully wrongly. Is that a fair statement, Rudy? I think so, yes. Okay, so tell us a little bit about that. How has Hawaiian culture and Hawaiian people, how have they been disrespected, dishonored, disturbed? Mm. Uh, well, thank you, first of all, thank you for having me on. I'm, I'm glad that we could be on today together. Um, you know, my background is in uh, researching incarceration in Hawaii, and I think when I think about the kinds of ways that um, Hawaiians and other uh, minorities have been treated um, throughout history, um, I tend to like to look at systems um, because I think a lot of times you can see certain elements in particular systems that can be transferred onto another system where you'll see the same patterns. Um, you know, for example, I think what we're seeing what I see in the way that um, prisoners in Hawaii are going through um, is, is similar and, and overlaps with the situation of COVID in 2020, um, particularly in the way that we view um, certain populations, uh, also in the way that they are affected by certain situations like the pandemic. Um, and I was I was on a Zoom call last night um, with some really amazing people uh, who were talking about the prison landscape. And it's really interesting to me, for example, that um, you know, for the last four decades, um, we've incarcerated uh, Hawaiians at a disproportionate rate. Um, and one of the things that uh, we were talking about last night was- I'm disproportionate, um, it's I'll just not, interrupting, but it, it's uh, pretty extreme, So right? generally, you know, Hawaiians, Hawaiians are generally 20% of our population in Hawaii, um, but 40% um, of the prison population. And that statistic in and of itself also is misleading um, because it's a statistic that keeps being reported year after year after year. Um, and so for me, there's there's two implications in there. First of all, when you go into a prison, you know that it's way more than 40% who are Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. And second of all, why, why is that particular um, data piece acceptable? <laughs> it's almost as if it's publicly accepted as the norm, you know? Um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought, but you know, no, but one of the things- you're doing that, that is, so if I'm understanding you correctly, in truth, Hawaiians are not twice as likely to be incarcerated as others. They are far more than that, three or four times as likely. Most definitely. And there is an effect that theoretically might be called indirect that isn't because it is so deep and so personal that it is direct. And that is, they know that. Yes. When they go outside, they know that even if they're just walking down the street at night, 
they are many times more likely to be stopped, questioned, treated adversarially, disrespectfully, suspiciously mm-hmm. by people with legal authority. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, it, there was a study that came out in the 80s that said that uh, the deeper Native Hawaiians go into the criminal justice system, the more likely they will be have longer sentences, the more likely they will be violated on parole or probation, um, and then receive even more punitive um, sanctions. Um, and, and then that also extends out to Native Hawaiians are the most disproportionately houseless in Hawaii, which is a tremendous tragedy. Um, particularly when you look at the uh, history of the illegal overthrow and the way that Native Hawaiians were a thriving community prior to that. So, you know, I think it's pretty egregious uh, what what is happening today uh, still with Native Hawaiians. This this pandemic has, uh, one of the things that uh, I'm on uh, different platforms and I hear a lot of people, you know, complaining about the tourists economy and the industry and nobody's social distancing and tourists are coming here and being belligerent to hotel staff workers and all these kinds of things. But really, the root is that this was not a tourist economy in Hawaii. And and Hawaii has been sold over and over and over. And this is the culminating result of doing that, of selling aloha. So let me ask, is not that sale process part of that that process of selling Hawaii as a commercial product, Mm -hmm. not a culture, not something human, not something to respect and understand? Yes, absolutely. Isn't that part of, or is it part of the intentional expansion of inequality to serve a few of select groups, some elements of which are racial and ethnic, Mm -hmm. as well as gender. This is not an accident, right? No, no. How does it connect with social justice? Well, I mean, I I think the obvious, at least for me, is that when you look at the prison industrial complex, I mean, black and brown bodies are, we commodify them. And, you know, you talk about a few privileged groups, it's really the stockholders, like in Core Civic, who are making, that, that company is making billions of dollars because they're not only building private prisons to warehouse people who are considered throwaways um, by certain privileged groups, but they also create subsidiaries of the company and they, this industrial complex just keeps, just keeps feeding itself really. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think a lot of it is the way that we perceive certain populations and those who have privilege and power um, it, it is very purposeful to denigrate certain populations. I One of the things I'll say, and I'll, I'll let you go ahead, Chuck, is, um, you know, there's, there's this tendency for us um, across the United States and in Hawaii to want to recognize disparate treatment. Um, but I think we're, we're beyond rec- recognizing and acknowledging and apologizing for these things, I and I, I think we we are at a stage where we have to be beyond these one-off solutions, um, where we're going to celebrate uh, somebody who did the right thing. No, this we I keep saying systemic change is needed, but I'm starting to think we need a system overhaul. Really, it needs to be turned upside down. Is it not the case then that that systemic overhaul of a system that has become increasingly inequality driven for the benefit of the few at the expense of many Mm. by categorization 
in the way that people are treated. Not just commodification, as you say, but commodification objectifies someone who which dehumanizes them. Right. It flattens out all of the things that make them a unique human being of value mm -hmm. for all of us. Mm -hmm. That's not right. But no. it's not just, and, and so the example that you're giving in the incarceration public safety sector it reflects exactly what is happening out on the streets with the police abuse mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. in the schools with the disparate treatment of those same marginalized minority groups. Excellent. And it is exactly the same groups in each of those sectors, healthcare, education, housing, environment, mm -hmm. climate, energy, mental health, mm -hmm. those same marginalized groups that are being underserved, that are being victimized, that are being dehumanized and disrespected. Yes. And they're yes. all individuals with human value. How yeah. do we get back to prioritizing that? I know. I mean, you know, honestly, some days I have feel like I have, you know, hundreds of answers for that. And other days it just is mind boggling to me that um, in the 21st century, as, as globally connected as we all are, that there still exists this tendency to uh, look at somebody as if they are not human, you know, to, to just kind of detach so greatly from humanity that people are willing to uh, mistreat people so terribly. I mean, you know, this whole year, obviously with the pandemic, but also with um, um, the politics and the election and everything else has been concerning and yet interesting in some ways because what what is most fascinating not in a positive way but most fascinating is the fact that you know generally about 50 percent of our of united states citizens um still hold views of certain populations as if they are not worthy of being full citizens and the thing that i go back to is um this is the roots and the foundation of how America was built. And I don't think that we've really resolved that or healed from it. And unless, unless we really address it at the core, uh, it's gonna keep, it's blowing up now, but it's gonna keep you know, presenting itself. Yeah, we have elected and appointed leaders who are actually using the words civil war. I know. Advocating violence, advocating secession. We yeah. have not seen yeah. that in yeah. many lifetimes. Yes. And they are doing that with impunity. Yes, they are. Hey. And so as much as we may understand that diversity, equity, and inclusion are key elements to moving back toward equality and away from the inequality that enables and in, in fact encourages these kinds of inhumane, anti-human behaviors. Mm -hmm. There is a fourth word element that is even more important and that is empowerment. Mm -hmm. Because if you diversify and make more equitable and more inclusive, your education systems and your healthcare systems and your employment systems and all that stuff. And you get more of the marginalized oppressed groups in, but they're not in the decision-making position. Yes. So the missing piece is empowerment. Mm -hmm. The DEI by itself without the other E is ineffective. I mean, I would agree enough. with that. And, and we saw the results of the fact that, you know, people are, are not em empowered or have a, a certain degree of power. And I mean, power in the greatest sense where you, you have power to serve others, you know, not to 
abuse them. But I mean, we saw that during the pandemic of who the essential workers were. You know, it, it was all a lot of dispossessed populations. They weren't sitting in the CEO's office or, you know, they were on the ground and they were essential and they've been the ones getting sick and they've been the ones losing their jobs and losing their homes. And, um, you know, my question is, you know, at how, how do we empower certain populations? Um, I think there's been many movements toward that and yes, they need to continue. But at the same time, I, I feel like we should be further ahead than we are. See, and that's a great question, Nadine. It's a, it's a brilliant insight. Because as I was watching Times Person of the Year program, and as much respect and aloha as I have for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, and I do, to me, ultimately, the true person of the year this year and every year, but especially this year, is the essential worker. Mm. We need to honor that. We need to respect that. We need to treat them mm -hmm. in the ways that they have long deserved. Mm -hmm. And that's possible because what history has shown is the only times in which essential workers have moved the needle at all toward equal treatment is after disasters, mm. especially epidemics and pandemics, mm. not so much after financial disasters. So you didn't see it after the 2008 crash. Right. You did see it after the Wall Street crash back mm. just before FDR, mm -hmm. because he came in and he engineered that direction, whether accidentally or in, on purpose. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure building projects okay, and all of the job cores and organizations and groups that were part of that essentially treated and honored essential workers mm -hmm. as the key element and rewarded them for that mm -hmm. and allowed them to make living wages, to have employment stability and security, to be able to have homes to be able to have their children have access to education, to be able to have access to healthcare. That was a revolutionary shift mm -hmm. in the 1930s mm -hmm. that happened because the one other element besides strong alliances of people of conscience, character, and courage, you have to have charismatic leaders mm -hmm who exemplify those same three elements of conscience, character, and courage. Mm -hmm. It will not happen without both. Agreed. They almost had it with JFK, RFK, and MLK. Right. But all three of them were assassinated. Mm. You don't have to have conspiracy theories to understand that the loss of those three charismatic, egalitarian leaders enabled the direction that has taken place in the 40 years since that time, mm -hmm. which is a direction toward inequality at the expense of the marginalized and oppressed. Mm -hmm. It is exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the company that you cite which is probably the leading private incarceration company in the country, maybe in the world, mm -hmm. was just the subject of PBS interviews last night. And one of the company representatives acknowledged that people have been treated far worse than they deserve and is acceptable. On the record, this was, and it was interesting because it was not the CEO speaking for the company. Mm -hmm. This was a young female mm. who was actually allowed to answer the questions. I wonder and if she answered them as question. honestly as she could. Yeah. yeah. And the PBS host who was interviewing, not 
not one of the best. I mean, not a racial matter, but, but she, she kind of plotted through it. Mm. And it was wonderful to see this young woman acknowledge mm. that whole classes of people have been treated far worse and more humanely than they deserve. Mm -hmm. And not to be able to have answers to, to show what has changed that will reverse this direction. Mm -hmm. And when you combine those two things, categorical mistreatment of marginalized people and the lack of responsible change, which is theoretically our show thing. Mm. It leads you one place, which is the same place that George Floyd's death led us. Mm. The same place that the revelation that Trump and his administration intentionally sought to further the spread of COVID fought the CDC, maligned the CDC, weakened the CDC and its ability to fight the pandemic with effective control measures. Mm. And instead adopted and flaunted exactly the opposite, knowing and intending that it would cause more illnesses, more deaths, more long-term effects. Right, and also more hatred. I mean, by politicizing the mask as a symbol of, of representing so many things, it's caused great division. Um, you know, one of my mentors and uh, the great one of my greatest teachers was Hanani K. Trask when I was at the university, and she used to always say, "The fight is over the ideology, and you'll find that ideology in symbols." And it's true. You know, when we uh, as citizens start to fight with each other over whether to wear a mask or not wear a mask. And, you know, many of uh, you see a lot of what Foucault talked about, that the masses will start to surveil the masses. And you're seeing that. And it's just such a disruption in society that not only takes away from humanity, but it takes away from our ability to be um, so much better for each other, for, for the place, for our nation. Um, very disturbing uh, with uh, the way that the administration has um, purposefully um, caused harm on its citizens. And it is not just the extent of the harm, it is which citizens. That is a categorical intentional harm right. to black, brown, marginalized, oppressed Absolutely. people. And Absolutely. how many sister Millie was my law school classmate. Oh, okay. So Hawaii is the ultimate no degrees of separation place, right? Yes. And so one of the things that they brought home and my late best friend ever in life, Pete Thompson was one of the activists in the Hawaiian Studies program, Waihole Waikane, mm -hmm. was one of Haunani's teammates in that struggle, in that effort. Right. And maybe that struggle, its tone and spirit, need to revive, mm -hmm. need to come back to life, because it's that struggle's tone and spirit. Mm -hmm. The fight not just against oppression, Right. It's a fight for measurable, meaningful progress toward real equality. Sure. In law, it's equal access to equal justice. Mm -hmm. Putting a marginalized person, giving them access to the legal system and pro bono representation or even public defender representation mm -hmm. does not level the playing field. No. Exactly no. what you have studied and talked about and explained to us has proven that. Mm -hmm. If it did, we would not have a huge percentage, a disproportionate percentage of black and brown people incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because what does that mean? It is 
I think, the metaphor of exactly what they face in life. They are controlled. Yes. They are restricted. They are without the freedoms, without the choices, mm -hmm. without the human dignity, honor, and respect that the others who take that from them intentionally for their own benefit inflict on them. Mm -hmm. So I'm left with the same four words that arose after George Floyd's and Breonna Taylor's mm -hmm. and the many other killings. And that is, that has to stop. It does. And we know that those patterns only stop if they are replaced by other and better patterns. Mm -hmm. Equal access to equal justice in every single sector mm -hmm. has to replace what leads to that treatment mm -hmm. in incarceration, in education, in police enforcement, in healthcare. Mm -hmm in employment. Yeah, I think you made us. a tremendous point, Chuck, about um, the need not to just fight against oppression, but to fight for something better. Um, and I would just cite um, the resistance uh, Kapu Aloha that we saw with Mauna Kea. It was one of the best movements I've seen in a long time, and they did not just fight against what was wrong, but they used that time to build, to build what they envisioned as a thriving society, and, and they succeeded. They succeeded, and out of it came many good things. I mean, we even have a new political party uh, in the election system. So I think there's something to be said about what are we fighting for? Uh, it's easy to want to fight against and we need to keep that front, but we need to start thinking about it in terms of what do we want to see and just start building it. And I think you're right. I think our takeaway from 2020 okay, and our hope and vision for 2021 is those alliances of people of conscience mm -hmm. to fight for equal access to equal justice in all sectors, because that's what Mauna Kea really symbolizes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Radine, thank you. Thank you. It's been wonderful with you. For all you are and all you do. Oh, thank you. And for all those who help take us in that good direction, keep having difficult conversations and making good trouble. See you in 2021. <laughs>